We're very pleased to welcome today uh, Wei Wei Hu. Welcome back, Wei Wei Hu, because as some of us know, remember Wei Wei was um, a postdoc here now a little while ago, um, and she is now um, an associate professor at the University of Georgia. Great, well done, Wei Wei. <laughs> And uh, today she will be talking to us about optimal control for suppression of singularity in chemotaxis. Thank you, Weiwei. Thanks, Ms. Wilson. Um, thank you, and eager for candy invitation and host here. It's always very pleasant um, being back, obviously being back. And it's very nice to, to visit USC campus. A lot of new buildings, very neat. Um, so today I'm going to talk about optimal control for suppression of singularities in chemotaxis. So in the past few years, I've been working on fluid flow control problems, especially a problem governed by flow transport systems. I have to understand how we can what, manipulate the behavior of the flu, uh, fluid via control of the vacuum term. So this is one of the applications recently I'm working on. And this is also a joint work with my uh, colleague, Min Jun Lai, and our uh, like joint student, Jin Su Lee. And this project is um, being supported by the NSF grants. Um, so today's talk, um, So today's talk has two components. First, I'm going to talk about the uh, suppression of singularity in chemotaxis where flow advection, where the mathematical model is described by the padlock taylor Segal equations. I will first talk about the global regularity and the stability analysis via a semi-group approach in bounded domain before I move to the control problem, which would be um, the second component of my talk. Um, then, uh, so second component focused on optimal control, um, how we design the fluid flow for suppression of the singularity in an optimal way. Of course, I'm going to address the existence of an optimal control and how we derive the first order of optimal condition to solve such controls. And in the end, I'm going to show you numerical examples to demonstrate the idea and designs, right? So to start with, let me first uh, introduce this um, mathematical model which is one of the classic parabolic and elliptic type of equations to describe this thermotaxis. So here, if you look at the first equation, so we have a nonlinear parabolic equations. Theta here stands for the population density of certain bacteria. And then the C stands for the concentration of the chemo attractant produced by the bacteria. Okay. Um, the C is governed by elliptic equation. So what happens here is, um, the, uh, the population density is going to move towards the direction where the C is. So in fact, the C is, this chemotractant is uh, produced by the bacteria itself. Now, when this parameter kappa here, I consider it as a constant and then positive parameter. When this parameter, uh, when the sensitivity parameter is positive, the bacteria is going to join to the chemotractant. So, the situation basically you can think about you have a boundary domain, which I'm actually interested in boundary domain with sufficient smooth boundary conditions. So this is your certain cells, right? The, the distribution of that stands for certain bacteria or cells. So it produces certain um, chemotractant, which is the C. So when you have this kappa being positive, all the cells is going to approach to the C. So that's what's going to happen. Now, if the comma, uh, excuse me, the uh, chi, or it's a chi, is negative, then uh, the bacteria is going to move away from it. Now, so that's basically the, the, the basic model uh, where we're going to work on. Then with zero Neumann boundary condition for both theta and C, one can easily show that the mass is conserved in the sense if you take the integral of theta, it's always equal to the initial mass for any T positive. Now, um, back in 1902, in Jaeger Lukahaus's paper, it says if we have a small initial condition, then we're able to get global existence of a solution. However, if the initial distribution is large, it may, um, oops, let's see. Okay. So 
large set of initial condition may expect exhibit finite time blow up. So essentially here is you think about if chi, the sensitivity parameter is part of all the materials going to approach to the C, I mean the uh, chemical attractant. So all the mass tend to focus on one single point. So you may expect like a delta function, the singularity behaves like a delta function. That's what's going to happen. And then in particular here in Herrero and Velasquez's paper and also related papers that showed very specifically if the initial distribution greater than certain threshold, even in 2D case, one would observe the blow up, finite time blow up. So let me show you uh, one example, very specific. Let's just look at unit square, the 2D, the chi, the sensitivity parameter is one. Okay. Consider we have a Gauss initial distribution with mass being some integer n times pi. So the initial distribution centered at the uh, center of my unit square. And then for this particular example, we know that eight pi is a critical mass, the critical threshold, which uh, means if the initial distribution greater than eight pi, we may expect the local, local time blow up. Smaller than this threshold, and then we get global existence solution. And then our student, uh, Jin Lee, did a numeric simulation, use land, um, let me see. Show you this. Oops, sorry, I'm stuck. So let me see the video. So if you look at, I have six plots. The first row here, I have the first figure has the initial mass in seven pi. Here's eight pi, eight five pi. The second row, I have 8.7, nine, 10, uh, 11. So you see, for all the initial mass greater than actually greater than or equal to a pi, we observe the accumulation of the, of the, of the mass focused on a single point, which means we, we may expect the, the uh, local in time blow up. Now, if the initial mass is smaller than seven pi, the solution is going to converge, okay? So I'm going to stop the video. Hopefully, um, uh, the, the basic idea is clear. So we, have, we do have this, um, Phenomenon. Okay. So then, see back to uh, slides. Then later on, um, we considered well to introduce the flow direction to the system. So here we have a direction term is a velocity dot gradient theta. Okay, and then velocity here we assume is to be compressible. And the normal component of velocity on the boundary is zero. So less than you know, less than exit through the boundary. And then there is a question raised here is can the vision prevent a possible blow up? So back in 17, Kessler and Xu, they showed for given initial theta smooth enough, uh, where they considered um, the periodic domain. There exists a smooth, incompressible flows V such that the unique solution theta is globally regular in time. So basically, the, it, it, it um, presents affirmative answer to the problem. If we introduce the flows, it's possible to express the uh, uh, singularity and get global um, existence solution. And the related result also obtained by these uh, references. Um, of course, here, one likes to understand what exactly is the observation term contributed to the problem. And then I would like to take a closer look about just simply a diffusion of the vaccine equation. And then like to understand how a direction would enhance diffusion. So that's the first question we need to address. And then we'll make use of this term to express the singularity, okay? So now let's, let's go back to the diffusion of the vaccine equations here. Again, V is incompressible and we still have this new boundary condition, okay? And then the no penetration boundary condition for V. So here the V, we, con we consider is time independent at the moment. And then A is a parameter which is regular in the strength of the flow, okay. Now in, in 2008, Constantin and his co-authors uh, showed the following results. The first introduced idea about so-called so relaxation enhancing. So what does this mean? The incompressible flow V on the domain is called re relaxation enhancing if for every tau and the um, delta, there exists the K, sorry, excuse me, uh, the A, such that for any A greater than this A, and any initial um, normalized um, 
vector, sorry, the functional tool, one can show that the solution can converge to its um, average as, as fast as you wish. Okay. And then if the flow has this property, we call it relaxation enhancing flow. And then the further characterize what type of flow has this property. Okay. So there's the main theorem. It says the flow in Lipschitz space, uh, in, in, um, which is Lipschitz over a domain, is relaxing, enhancing if and only if the operator, the division operator, has no eigenfunction in H1, other than the constant function. So it's a very specific characterization uh, to address which direction or which flow has a property satisfy this relaxa uh, relaxation enhancing, okay? If, again, the direction operator has no eigenfunction in H1, and then one can increase the A, actually the parameter A, to enhance the diffusion, okay? So that's basically the result they got. And then I would like to revisit this result in terms of the spectrum analysis and semi-group. So and now, um, Keep this idea in mind, and then let's move to uh, the operator and semigroup formulation for this problem. And it's well known in this operator, right? It's a Laplace and subtract the direction term. This is that uh, what I show is strictly negative. And um, if we use the variation of parameters formula, we can express a solution to the diffusion direction equation using this form, right? And the semigroup E2, the operator times T, actually is analytic, right? So let's briefly re review what so-called analytic semigroup. So if the semigroup, which is analytic over a sector, which contains non-negative real axis, that's called an analytic semigroup. So specifically spe um, speaking has three properties, right? So the mapping from Z to TZ is analytic in the sector. And the following two properties, there's a standard properties for the strongly continuous semigroup. Now, uh, if I pull to another, Talking about the, uh, the semigroup, so you can think about the semigroup, it's analytic over certain sectors. Okay. Okay. Now, further, I would like to introduce the idea about rapid decay properties. Now, if we can find some parameters M and some um, some omega a such that the operator norm of the semigroup is more than equal to m times e to omega a t, where this omega, the decay rate can be absolutely large, yet this m is independent of omega a. Then we call the semigroup has the rapid decay property, okay? Um, so in fact, this uh, decay rate is something we like to play with via the direction term. Now here, this is just a standard not notation, which uh, this script L stands for all the uh, bounding operators on, on some here, but space X, and this is just operator norm. Okay. Now, as I said, I would like to revisit Constantine's result in 2008. And then in fact, I find the recent result by way from 2021, he uh, presented the, the hard proof type of theorem for this type of semigroup. Okay. This theorem in particular for M accretive operators, the um, classic family of operators, elliptic operators, which, which are m um operators. Um, this operator basically is a kind of operator which is closed in the half of the space, and the left open half plane is contained in the resolvent set. And in particular, resolvent operator um, has, the norm of the resolvent operator has this estimate related to real component of the of the point in the resolvent set. Okay. And then if the operator satisfies the two properties, it's so-called emocratic operators. Okay. And what we did is the following. So he defined the C of the operator as the infimum of this operator subtract an imaginary point and act on any um, element in the domain of this operator. This element is norm uh, to be one. And then you can show the Operator norm, the semigroup norm actually is bounded by some m times e to this per c times t. Okay, this m is a is a fixed number, it's a constant e to pi two, is very precise. Okay, then he further showed that if we look at the space, which is a mean zero L two space, and then I'm showing that the decay rate per c converges to infinity, goes to infinity as this parameter a, which is the parameter in front of your uh, direction term. 
if and only if the direction operator has no eigenfunction in H1 intersects with X. They so basically get rid of those, those even constant, um, possibly constant eigenfunction. Okay. So uh, I will mainly focus on where if we have a rapid decay property, then I can get global uh, well postness of the uh, PK um, S system. Now, um, back in 20, actually, I or she and then the Lotto, um, the Lotus, they actually showed if the semi group has the following properties. Say, if the semi group moves from T to T plus some tau star, the operator norm bounded by one half, then there exists some small tau knot such that if this dissipation time is smaller than t, uh, this, this uh, tau knot, they can, they can show the global well poseness of the PKS system for either two or three dimensional. So basically, there's another way says if the Fleming group has certain rapid decay property, right? This is a rapid decay properties, then they're able to get the global well poseness. Um, so they work on the, um, the theoretical domains. Now I like to redo this for bounded domain because my control is going to apply to problems which mainly define the bounded domain. And I'm going to use same group approach. All right, so here's our analysis. Now to start with, I'm going to um, make the change of variable. I let very theta be theta subtract its average, okay? So I want to show that very theta um, uh, is going to, well, we get well, uh, the global well postness for the translated system. And uh, in the end, the theta converts theta bar exponentially with the presence of your advection term. Okay. Of course, V need to satisfy certain property okay, to have this uh, rapid decay property of the same group. So here is the main theorem. Now, for any initial data, translated ones in um, the average zero space, after the made the change of variable, then the average of theta naught, this new one, is, is zero. Okay. For any velocity, time dependent is essentially bounded over the space, it diverges free with normal component um, along the boundary zero. Um, one can show that if the decay rate of the semigroup is large enough, so rapid decay, and there exists a unique solution to the system, satisfying the following regularity property, and also um, it's bounded by the initial data plus some constant. So this is the global result, and moreover, one, one can show the exponential decay. Okay. Now, the proof, basically, we uh, utilize the fixed point theorem. Um, first, uh, we need to understand um, the nonlinearity. Okay, so here I'm going to define the nonlinear map n maps from H1 to my state space. Again, it's is an average, the mean zero space, subspace of L2. So this is a nonlinear term, and I'm going to introduce the map script T maps theta to this um, looks like my variation formula um, expression. Right now, for any initial data in X and theta in the space um, space eight, X and the continuous in time, okay? Then if theta, very theta is a solution to my translated system, then I can show there is a fixed point to satisfy this relation, right? Then in the following proof, I would utilize the properties, well, just utilize the, uh, um, well, I'm going to apply the fixed point theorem to show three indeed has a unique solution. To this end, I will again recall some basic properties about my system operator L and the semigroup properties, especially analysis about semigroup and how to bound the nominal term. Now, to start with, so here, recall, if we have Neumann boundary condition associated with our system operator, and then we can identify the domain as following. So you can identify the fractional power of the negative L. Right. L is a strict, strict negative operator, and negative L is a, uh, is a strict positive operator. Now, it's fraction power up to three quarter. You can exactly identify the domain of this operator to the H to two um, sigma intersects with X. Okay? Now, if sigma is greater than three quarter, we need to include the Neumann boundary condition. Okay? The boundary condition appears. Now, if the uh, theta is actually equal three, Quarter. And then the function in the domain has, um, we, we have additional condition on the functions where uh, when it approaches to the boundary. So in fact, the domain of this operator is smaller than 
age of three and a half intersex sex. That's it. So that's something we need to make it clear before we, uh, before we uh, investigate the name in a term. Now, the um, first name uh, is a classical about analytic semi-group. So if E to L T is an, is an analytic semi-group, we know um, there exists constant being positive uh, to, uh, to have the C equal to the hold. So this guy can handle the, the uh, fractional uh, power of the uh, elliptic operator L, okay? and then bounded by this, okay? bounded by these terms. And then for this problem, we use this um, um, the result from way. So we know this parameter M is, is essentially related to E to pi half and the power you like to put down here. Okay? It's very precise. And then now let's look at the nonlinear term. So for the nonlinear mapping, okay, let's just go back. So you can see the nonlinear mapping. It's not really bad. It's sort of quadratic in the sense that uh, the n actor theta in terms of L2 norm can be bounded by H1 norm of theta to the power. Okay? So here's a lower term. Then we like to compare how, how nonlinear this compared to a system operator. Then we need a, a negative three quarter to bound the L. Okay? If we estimate this term in L2, then this can be bounded by theta back in L2 squared. Okay? So this power is, is very important. Um, this has to be strictly smaller than one. Then with those results at our disposal, we can show that for any initial condition in X, we let this ball in the space C, which is continuous, the function is continuous in, in time and space-wise in L2. So this is both centered of the region with radius R uh, being greater than two times the L2 normal initial data. Okay. Any, any radius greater than this one would be fine. So this is a ball. Okay. And then can show that um, there exists the per se, the decay rate, which depends on initial data, and then which is large enough such that this, this ball is invariant under our um, mapping, okay? So, which means you, you uh, for any point in the ball, you apply the map to this point to stay in this ball, right? And then also the map is a contraction mapping on this ball, okay? That means we can find a constant which is more than one, right? Such that this estimate holds. So with these two property holes, then we actually can kind of claim that there exists a fixed point, right, to the uh, to the map and stay in, in the ball. That's our solution. Furthermore, one can show that there, there exists constant tau star, and also um, this this parameter rely on the uh, the tau star. Okay, but in the end, we can just. Uh, uh, unify it, depend on the initial condition. I think I, I, I didn't uh, change this. So which is sufficiently large such that you can do the iterative estimates um, to have this holds. And then as a result, one can obtain the uh, exponential decay of the solution. So this is how we uh, use semi-group approach to get the global well closeness and stability by a semi-group approach. And then, however, um, as I said, Earlier, if one wants to get this uh, rapid decay property, the flow satisfied property that, well, we, we need the flow satisfied property that the um, directional operator has no eigenfunction in H1 intersect X. However, um, it's rather complicated to construct such a velocity. And then sometimes even you, you, you construct it and then the geometry may not be very regular. Then, in Ayer's paper, again, the same paper, they consider the, two, the uh, cellular flow as a very good protocol to generate the flow field uh, has a property which leads to the rapid decay um, semi-group. Um, so they considered um, the 2D cellular flow as well as the 3D. Well, of course, the 3D, um, we're going to consider the flow with cubic cells a little bit more complicated. So to demonstrate the idea, we mainly focus on the 2D case. So their main result says, we know this um, cellular flow does not really have mixing property, okay? So basically, um, the, 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 it does not satisfy the condition that this autovection operator has no eigenfunction. It does have has eigenfunctions. However, if you rescale the cell size and the flow amplitude, for example, you increase um, the, uh, the the frequency of the uh, the flow, the cellular flow, and also its amplitude, and then they can get the dissipation time can be. 
uh, absolutely small. On the other hand, you can, the uh, semi-group, in fact, generated by such um, advection diffusion operator has rapid decay problem. So that's what I would like to show use um, a spectral analysis and also the semi-group approach. By the way, their proof is based on the probabilistic methods. Okay? It's rather different. So what I would like to show you again, I want to show you when we rescale the cell size and amplitude, in fact, they're going to push the eigenvalue far away from, from the uh, imaginary, okay? So to say this, let me briefly review the eigenvalue eigenfunctions of the Laplace in a rectangle-like domain, either two or three, okay? So let's simply look at the Laplace operator with Neumann boundary condition mean, mean uh, where the functions mean zero. And then we know the eigenfunctions Sorry, the eigenvalue is basically the superposition of the eigenvalues for the variable in each coordinate. And the eigenfunction is product of the, the eigenfunctions corresponding to uh, each uh, lambda, right, each uh, coordinate. And in particular, for each coordinate, we have the eigenvalues being negative n squared pi squared and rounds from one. Uh, we need to get rid of the zero eigenvalue, right, because it's mean zero. And then the eigenfunction uh, precisely a product of the cosine and pi xi, right? If you have 2D, you have like x1, x2, right? Product of cosine m pi x and then cosine m pi z, x2. And, all, and then and also recall that the eigenfunctions form the complete orthogonal basis of your state space, right? So that's just a very classical result. And then with the perturbation, let's look at the, the first case. If I perturb it by this advection term, the bx just be my cellular flow, which in fact I have a plot here, you can see clearly how the flow looks like. We have four cellulars here, cells. Um, and then the LN stands for the term where I rescale the frequency and the amplitude of the flow. Okay. Then, of course, the operator have the same domain, right? So those are the vection terms are essentially lower perturbation of your Laplacian. Okay. And by the way, the perturbation um, does not really perturb the spectrums out of the uh, spectrum of the Laplace, okay? those because the velocity is, is mean compressible. Okay? You can see the spectrum after perturbed per still stay in where the, uh, the spectrum of the Laplace is a subset essentially. And one can show that if we, we, we know this lambda L1 is the eigenvalue of um, L1, say with a corresponding eigenfunction um, phi, and then we can show that n squared lambda L1 is the eigenvalue of this operator L n after we scaled. And then the eigenfunction essentially okay, is as, uh, can be described as follows. So here, let me, let me go back to look at the eigenfunction of L1 associated with this lambda. And then, you know, the, uh, as I mentioned, we have the complete basis, right, due to the eigenfunction of Laplace. So, the, the eigenfunction of L1 can be expressed as a linear compilation of the basis function, right? And the coefficient is, is the inner product of phi with each basis, right? And then when you rescale the X, essentially what we see is you um, shift the energy of the eigenfunction from the lower to the higher eigenmodes. That's why the energy displays much faster. Okay. So you see, originally, uh, you have the coefficient of phi, for example, uh, this is a very phi, <laughs> is associated with, uh, say, n1, nd of x. And then after you rescale it, it's, it's a coefficient of, of a much higher frequency mode, like the eigenmode with much higher frequency. So therefore, rescaling essentially converts energy from low to higher uh, eigenmodes and then dissipates energy faster, you can see that way. And then we call the spectrum map, the spectrum um, bound of the operator defined by the soup of the uh, real component of the um, eigenvalues, right, in the spectrum. And then by spectrum mapping theorem, one can show that there exists some constant which is greater than one or equal to one, independent of the, uh, the scale n. And then the operator norm, the semigroup, is bounded by this m times e to the uh, spectrum bound times t. So therefore, when you, when you rescale the flows, you can increase or actually decrease the spectrum, uh, the, uh, the, the semigroup bound, the decay rate. So you can make this guy absolutely small by increasing the n. So therefore, uh, 
this rapid decay properties holds. So based on the uh, previous theorem I have shown, then we can get the global well closeness of the PKS system. Right. So that's pretty much the idea how we get the, um, uh, the well closeness work and how we get the rapid decay properties for those flows which does not have this relaxation in Hansen property, okay? It's still possible. But then the general question is, uh, other than cellular flow, any other candidates have such a nice property? Okay? That's a rather challenging question because you want to make sure rescaled, after rescaled, the icon function first of all st still stay in the, the, the domain of your operator. So what, what type of flow would lead to that property is rather interesting property, a rather interesting question. Okay. So um, as I said, um, before we move to control problems, we uh, understanding the global well closeness is, is, is the, the, the most important thing, okay? Uh, so next part, next, next I'm going to talk about optimal control for suppression of singularity, the PKS system. So here, as I shown, of course, one can um, increase the um, frequency and amplitude of the flow to get the uh, global well closeness. The question is, it may not be a good idea to simply increase the magnitude, right? And what would be the optimal one? So you think about it in real life, um, if we have certain heat focused on the dust area, it's very hot here, you like to introduce a fan, right? And then the question is how you're able to introduce a fan? What would be the reasonable orientation and the, the uh, intensity of the fan, right? So that's, that means how you're going to introduce an optimal flow field, right, for the advection. So here, I'm going to consider the following problem. Now I'm going to assume velocity being some function in time, and not simply just a scalar, okay? Function ut times the, the spatial profile, which is a cellular flow, okay? Then what I'm interested in, I'm, I'm going to control the ut to get the optimal uh, control to generate my advection term, okay? So what would be the of orientation and what would be the of intensity for, um, for sort of optimally distribute the heat, or in this case is to suppress the singularity or uh, advect the C so that theta is, is not going to accumulate a single point, right? So, so this is my new model and my cost of functional here. First of all, I would like to, add, to, to minimize the average distribution of the theta. And also at fine time TF, I want the theta is as small as possible and with my optimal control input, right? When you turn on the fan, you would ask what would be the cost, right? What would be the optimal cost to, to service for your purpose? And here, this TF is final time is, is something we are given and the alpha beta the parameters we need to choose and then they call the state um, weight parameters. And then gamma up here is the, is the weight for your control. Normally, if the gamma is large, it means your control is very expensive, okay? So if gamma is small, that means it's reasonable. It's not that expensive for your, for your cost to maintain your control, something like that. And then here, I'm going to just simply choose my the set of the admissible control being L2. And now I also assume there are upper and lower bounds for your control input. You think about when you turn on the fan, there is some upper and lower limit. You cannot really let them go to infinity, right? I put some bounds. And then whenever we solve for optimal control problem subject PDE, especially here is a non-linear control problem, right? You have this control input is associated with your state. So this leads to non-linear problem and therefore this problem may not be convex. So um, we can show the existence, but not necessary uniqueness of the solution. Um, so let me first show briefly the idea how we, how we get the, the existence of the solution. So first of all, as I showed earlier, you can take the UN, uh, the UT, just the BN, right? If A is large enough, and you can show the global uh, existence, and then you can get the existence of a solution. So it means the solution set is not empty. Then to show the existence here, um, I mean, uh, in the more, how should I say, rigorous way, we follow the so-called direct method. So the idea is, first of all, we look at the cost of function that we define, certainly this, this, this uh, J is non-negative and then it's bounded from below. And we, we can choose a minimized sequence from your control set such that um, 
when m goes to infinity, the sequence equals the infimum of your cosine functional. Okay, and then we can show there exists a subsequent sequence denoted by u m. So whenever you have a u m, you have a theta m, which weakly converges to some solution u theta u uh, star and theta star due to the uniform boundedness of the solution uh, of the control and also the solution we showed earlier, right? And then we use the weakly lower semi-continuity property of the norm, which building in the J, one can show J evaluated at U star is more than equal to infimum, right? Compared to the first line here, and then one can claim that this U star is indeed an optimal solution to a system. So this is sort of very um, uh, classic idea about showing the existence. I skipped the, the details. And again, uniqueness in general does not hold. And the, um, one way we can do is if one um, makes the control weight very large, you may get, you somehow, um, you, you, you penalize the problem so it becomes convex, then you can get um, the uniqueness. Otherwise, in general, a uniqueness does not hold. And then, so now we know the existence, then how can we solve the, the, uh, the optimal control? Like in calculus, uh, you take the derivative of the function, right? If you know the function is differentiable, you take the derivative is said to be zero, the critical points are your candidates. So here we follow the same idea. Instead of a simple derivative, we're going to um, introduce so-called the Gattol derivative, and which is a directional derivative. Um, and then use variational inequality to derive the optimal condition. So what does this mean? So first of all, let me use, um, uh, the J prime U dot H stands for the Gattol derivative with respect to U in the direction H. Again, you can think about this as a, the uh, direction of derivative. And then if the U is an optimal solution to our problem, then the variational inequality holds. So the J prime evaluated at the U in the direction H, any H is greater than or equal to the J prime evaluated at the optimal solution and the inner direction of the, the optimal solution. So basically, if here is the optimal solution, then in other direction, if you move, the function is going to increase. So that's what the variational inequality says. And then technically speaking, how we compute this, you basically parameterize your function u by introduce a small perturbation, right, in terms of parameter lambda. And then you just uh, take the derivative with respect to lambda and then set it to be zero. If the limit exists for all the h in your control set, then we call j is Gattel differentiable. Okay, and then in the following, I'm going to apply the um, variation inequality to figure out my um, my automatic condition and then solve the U. Now think about because we are working on the infinite dimensional system, um, problems in a sense the um, the state space is X right is a mean zero L two space you have an infinite infinite number of um, basis functions right and then you have an infinite infinite many of directions for a function. Uh, you have to, uh, to test the, your cost of functional. So if we simply want to uh, compute this, that's, that's a very, um, um, it's very costly. Then I'm going to show you so-called the joint method to derive the uh, optimal condition. So first of all, um, we have cost of functional, then I'm going to introduce, so I'm, I'm going to look at what's the Gattel derivative. I, by following the definition, and then you have to take the um, direction, sort of direction derivative of each term in your cost functional. And then I'm going to introduce this z, um, and let z be the Gattel derivative of the state variable theta at the u, which is a control in the direction h. Then I can rewrite the Gattel derivative of j u h um, in terms of this form, okay? And then this z is essentially the first variation of the state variable theta. Okay, so you can think about this as a linearization of theta around your u. Okay, and then this operator a inverse, this graph a inverse, um, this a is basically I uh, introduce it to rewrite the c. Remember, c was solved, so c right, was an elliptic equation and was a normal boundary condition. So I basically introduced the operator scrap A to rewrite the C in terms of my, okay, just the full um, the notation, the convenience of the notation. And of course, you, once you shift to the identities, A is become invertible. So, and then I can rewrite my first variation of the course of function of this form. Then this Z appears here is not very pleasant 
um, to, to tell us information about the conditions for solving you. So what we do is we try to introduce a joint state row, such as its first two terms, which involves Z, can be rewritten as the function, which only in terms of your state, theta, and the joint state row with a test function. You can think about this H as a test function, okay? And then in the end, we can, we can do this uh, through um, um, integration by parts, actually. One can show um, these two terms can be replaced by the term which is given by this, okay? Then the row, the joint state uh, is governed by the backward um, PDE, okay? So in fact, the row is very often solved by when you take the inner product of row with the z equation, you can get the information how to derive the row. Okay. So in the end, let me just summarize, skip the details how to derive that um, a joint system, and then and then do this calculation. Basically, just just some some technical stuff. Then here the second minimum theorem. If my initial data in L infinity, and then this b this b the the uh, fluid flow. Is also essentially bounded and divergent free satisfies boundary condition. Now, if you is the optimal solution to our problem here, theta is the corresponding solution to the state. So given the U, right, we can we can find a theta. And there exists the joint state row satisfy the following optimal system. So the state equation basically the governing PDE and then the joint system, which very often travel backward in time. So we know the final time condition of row related to your state variable evaluate at the TF. So the travel backward in time. And then the automatic condition for solving the U or characterize the U is given by, so you first take the integral of the state times greater than the row dot the B, B is the, the, the velocity and divide by control weight. Since we have the bounds for the U, so we need to project this term to the interval where the bounds are. So then this is the way you solve the, the U. So numerically, we do an iterative approach. You given some initial data, theta naught, and some initial U, you can find your theta. After you get the theta, you solve all the way, and you find the theta in final time, and then you solve the row backward in time. You get a row, and you get a row theta, and then you apply this automatic condition. You update the U, and through this iterative result, you can solve the U over time. Okay. So here, back to the example we showed earlier. Remember, uh, for this example, for the initial Gaussian distribution, if the initial mass greater than eight pi, we observe the local time, local in time blow up. Now, for this example, luckily one can show we take the n v one. Is sufficient to suppress the, the flow. Now I'm going to demonstrate um, what would be our optimal control to suppress this. So in second video. So keep in mind the initial condition was um, was 10 pi. So the left figure here, this is arranged in the case without the direction. You will observe uh, the local in time below up. It's actually at the center. So the mass focused on the center, then go down. So the second term here, well, this runs very fast because um, the, the, the direction term is really efficient to suppress the uh, singularity. So the second term, oh, sorry, the second figure, let me play it again. It quickly suppresses singularity. And you can see how this um, advection the cellular flow work, right? The orientation. Again, I think you probably still observe the moving, right? Yeah. So it's a comparison with out and with controls. And then. Here. So with the control, you will see in the end, the L infinity norm of theta actually exponentially decays. So, so the right-hand side, this figure is just uh, this, uh, we enlarge this interval, local interval from zero to uh, 0.5 to say better how it behaves, L, L infinity norm in, in terms of time. Okay, it does follow the exponential decay. And here's the control. So th this figure shows how the control behaves in terms of T. And again, this figure is a, 
enlarged uh, uh, interval, which is from um, 0 to 0.05, you see the UT oscillates. You do have positive and negative sign of it. Means you do have to sometimes change the orientation of the orientation term um, to get the optimal uh, result. It's not necessarily just to blow in your air or, or um, introduce a flow in one direction. Uh, increase the, the amplitude may not be the good idea. Sometimes you do need to oscillate, like a change of orientation or the strength. So you can see how the control behaves. It's also it's, and then at theta converges to zero, control of course also converges to zero. So that's pretty much um, the main stuff I like to present today. And here um, some un ongoing research. Um, another thing we observe that if you somehow um, change the center of your initial data. Remember the uh, Gaussian the experiment we did centered or at the center of your domain. If you change that using the same uh, type of uh, cellular flow, it may, when n equals one may not work. So how can we figure out the center of the flow and then also the, uh, the frequency with respect to different initial data is something that would be interesting to investigate. So this basically leads to questions where would be the optimal actuator Right, of your flow. If you think about it, it's like uh, where you put your fan. For example, the heat focused on here, if you put your fan over that corner, it won't be effective, right? Then the question is how we, we uh, play with this um, uh, actuator or the flow, to how, where to generate the flow with respect to the initial distribution of the data. So something interesting to explore. And then, as I mentioned earlier, are there any other protocol to generate the flow fields other than cellular flow? something simple one can easily uh, generate and manipulate the ways. And then of course, uh, one of the most important question I'm very interested in have been always working on is feedback ball. And how can you just control the flow based on the distribution of the data? Um, so, because the optimal control always give you an open loop control in the sense, your control not only depend on the state, but also the joint. When you solve this optimal consistent, Optimized system really, really time consuming. You have to solve the state all the way to the final time and then solve the joint all the way from the final time travel back. And then you couple it with this nonlinear optimal condition. So computationally, it's really time consuming. If one is able to um, establish the feedback law where you only depend on theta, and then that would, uh, um, on one hand, improve the numeric, uh, the computational cost. On the other hand, in terms of control series, it will be more robust. Um, and of course, this type of design or the idea uh, make use of the vection to enhance um, diffusion so that get nonlinear turn in, co in control has many applications. Uh, for example, some other application in quenching the reaction diffusion and also in, uh, in the control of at least threshold in ecology um, in the art of um, um, bio phenomenons um, is some problems I'm, I'm looking at at the moment. I think that's all I like to present today. Um, any questions? Thank you very much. Questions or comments? <laughs>